Okay, okay no problem. Uh, thank you. I think we will continue with the next speaker, which is Dr. Silke Kohl from uh, Italy, and she will introduce us in how exosomes target tumor cells. Okay. Uh, so, as you could see, I continue, and I'm very happy that you already gave the introduction of content and exosomes in general. Um, I will start with a short overview. As you already do I have a pointer? The, the, no. no. This one? This one. This one. Thank you. Sorry. So, as you already said, um, there are different extracellular uh, vesicles. They are the uh, so-called exosomes, and they are in the range usually between 30 and 120 nanometers. And they are the microvesicles, which are in the range of 100 to 1,000 nanometers. Um, they have different origin, and I think this is a very critical point also when you are preparing your nanoparticles. And this could be something very interesting also when you want to use them for, for medical applications. The exosomes are produced in an intraluminal vesicle inside the cells in multivesicular bodies, and that finally fuse with the plasma membrane and the, the vesicular structures are released. So, on the other hand, you have the microvesicles, and microvesicles are more or less extrusions from the plasma membrane. And I think this is a very critical point which we have to keep in mind when we are producing and thinking about using exosomes and microvesicles for treatment and as a drug delivery system. Because these microvesicles, due to the fact that they are generated by extrusion from the from the plasma membrane should have the fully intact uh, glycocalyx, which is also very important in terms of inter <coughs> sorry in terms of interaction with the immune system. Um, usually, exosomes, microvesicles are used interchangeable. There is no real distinction, but I think we have to be more careful when we are talking about it because. When you see that these are pro the exosomes are produced inside the cells, why these are extrusion or protrusions from the membrane with a glycocolyx on the surface with, let's say, an uh, immune recognition, which is uh, or um, an immune tolerance, which is already against the cells. I think there will be different properties in this too. The other point is that. Uh, we have also viruses, and at the end, you can see that viruses, exosomes, and microparticles, at least from their physical chemical properties, they are quite similar. It's the same exosomes, microparticles, and viruses use hijack specific uptake mechanisms for vesicles uh, in the cells, and in this case, they are all the same. They will have different properties, but at the end, when you break it down, a virus and an exosome, with having a lipid layer, and as they found recently, some, RNA, uh, some DNA content inside, they are very similar like a virus without the, uh, the, the uh, capsid. So, the exosome content, you already heard, and I will not go in more detail. Usually in health, you have some proteins, peptides, microRNA, mRNA, enzymes, a lot of other molecules. What was found was that the composition is usually independent of the abundance of the molecules in the cytosol, which indicates that there is an orchestrated and very well-defined packing of the molecules into this vesiculus. In cancer, there is also some microRNA, mRNA, but uh, there is also some DNA, which was recently found to be in, in exosome preparations, proteins, pen, peptides, enzymes. But in that case, it was found that the composition reflects the abundance of the molecules in the cytosol. And this usually indicates that there is a random engulfment of the uh, cells and no organized packing. 
Then we have the surface molecules. And as I said, usually we use exosomes in microvesicles as they are more or less the same. But when microvesicles, which originate from the plasma membrane, usually they have, they sh still should have the glycocalyx on the present on the surface of the cells. Then usually you find claudines and oclodines. You find the tetraspanines, which are usually also used to identify exosomes, like the CD63 and the CD81. Both, you can see that they are used for entry of bacteria and hepatitis, or hijacked for, for, from bacteria and from hepatitis C for entrance into the cells. Then it was found that heparin sulfate binding is one of the parameters how the exosomes attach to the target cell and they are <coughs> starting the entry mechanisms, uh, mecha mechanism and there are some immune, immune modulators on the surface. And um, the immune modulators usually are that one which are giving this favorable properties to the exosomes, why they are so interesting now as a potential drug delivery system. Because when you take liposomes, you have very often this uh, so-called CARPA effect, complement uh, related activation of the uh, pseudoallergy. And um, this can be perhaps avoided if you are using instead of plain lipid vesicles in a very simple composition. You use the exosomes, you fill them with a drug, and you use the immune modulating or immune uh, stealthing properties of exosomes. These are usually by a, a couple of modulators or even molecules which are uh, in interfering with the immune system and they have different uh, functions. I will not go into much detail. My favorite one is this, the FOSL, l for example, which is found in uh, exosomes released by cancer cells. And the FOSL l is very interesting because it's uh, playing an important role in uh, creating immune tolerance. So it's... Uh, inducing apoptosis in activated T cells, and it's just killing them. So it looks like that when we bind some of these molecules, also perhaps to our normal nanoparticles, we are able to avoid or modulate immune response. This is one of the lessons we can learn from, let's say, from nature, from nature's already immune stealthy uh, nanoparticles that binding the right ligands on the surface, which are actively interacting with the immune system, that uh, we can easily avoid getting a real immune response or we can modulate the immune response so that recognition will be avoided. The cancer targeting is Let's say one of the things, as I said, there are some claudines, oclodines. Claudines and oclodines are molecules which are usually uh, involved in the tight junctions, and they were found on uh, exosomes in a very high uh, concentration. Usually, the downregulation of claudines is correlated with a, a loss of uh, cellular cohesion, so it makes a lot of sense that this could, could be one of the processes in cancer, and upregulation usually interferes with the normal tight, func tight junction. Um, you see that in some cases, like for example in prostate tissue, pros no, in tumoric prostate tissue or in colon uh, cancer, you see that there is an upregulation of some claudines, which is quite interesting because it should be the other way around. But anyhow, some of these claudines and, uh, um, are uh, induced and embedded in the exosomes. Normal tissue also express different types of uh, um, claudines, and as you could see, there is, a sp there is some tissue specificity, which could be one of the indicators why metastasis or cancers are only produced in, uh, in certain tissues, or why 
uh, exosomes are able to come from the original tumor and going only to specific sites in the body or in specific uh, organs in which then they are preparing the metastatic niche. Because when, tet when you have uh, claudines, there is some claudines which uh, make a so-called kiss connection and uh, they are binding as homodimers. So if I, uh, uh, yes, as homodimers. So if I have a claudine one on the surface of my exosome and I have a claudine one on the surface of a specific tissue, it's possible that there will be binding of this uh, uh, exosomes labeled with the claudine. So what we did was we were analyzing some uh, cells, uh, tumor cells, which were releasing uh, exosomes in the, in the supernatant. And we mainly found in at least this particular one um, claudine in, only in the cells, but not in the exosomes. And um, we will continue because uh, the, the uh, Claudine 5 is not one of the most uh, typical ones. So we are going now for looking for other Claudines to try to understand if this could be another potential mechanism of binding of the uh, exosomes to particular cells. And uh, because if we want to use the exosomes as an immune stealth drug carrier for the treatment of cancer cells. We have to understand the structural properties, the origin and the function, which allows them to target specific cells, to bind to specific cells, and to uh, carry their cargo to this particular cells. Um, I thank you for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, presentation. Are there questions from the audience? Uh, perhaps the person behind Rutgers. So thank you for the nice presentation. There is a, a, a phase three clinical trial for cancer immunotherapy using exosomes. And this particular drug is exosomes are extracted from cancer cell lines. And the hypothesis is that these exosomes are uh, containing cancer antigens, and then uh, it would immunize the person against specific cancer antigens. So it was, you pointed out that it might, exosome might kill uh, T cells. So how do you see this, uh, this kind of exosome approach for immunotherapeutic purposes? It's an interesting question, actually, because this is, I think we we have to stop thinking of exosomes in general because I think if we know that there are some exosomes released containing a FASL which can prevent immune recognition or uh, regulate or modulate the immune response, I think we have to, to, to be aware of that and we have perhaps to purify our exosome preparations in a different way if we want to use them as a drug and for immune th therapy. Because if the tumor induced already immune uh, tolerance by releasing exosomes by itself to the, uh, to the, to the uh, body, and uh, this was induced by, let's say, either the uh, MHC classes or by the FASL, and then we are using this piece of tumor again to try to, un to, to induce an immune therapy, it, we can only fail. So this is something we have to take into consideration, that the tumor at a certain point was already releasing exosomes with the purpose to induce immune tolerance, and it caused immune, immune tolerance. Ilke, is it known which tumor is releasing exosome and which not? I, I think at the end what we have to try, it, but on the other hand, as I said, this tumor released exosomes which created immune tolerance. So well, what we need to, to have, uh, what we try to have to do is to re uh, reverse this immune tolerance against the tumor. 
it's not so much that we can try an immune therapy, but we have to try to, to in, let's say, reverse this autoimmunity against the tumor tissue. Mm -hmm. that's, that's... Uh, isn't there also a certain danger, um, as long as you don't know precisely the content of the exosomes, as you, if you derive them from a tumor cell, that you may even be in danger of uh, causing harm in terms of causing cancer? Are you asking me? No, you have to ask uh, me. I, I don't know. Sense. It's not my <laughs> clinical trial. <laughs> I read in the literature, so I'm also not very positive about this, uh, this uh, approach, but uh, so we will see. I mean, I just, uh, I don't know. I know there are, there are other approaches going on where you empty the exosomes before you put in a drug, for example. And this one is not emptied, collected no, the exosome from tumor cells and immu using for immunizing the patient. Yeah. It, it makes my point exactly pointing to what I said in the beginning. The exosomes have to be treated like a virus. You have the same problem when you are working with genetically engineered viruses. You usually try to remove the content in order to avoid that there are additional problems from what is still inside. And I see the same risk when you have the, the uh, immune therapy basing or using exosomes. Yeah, last question. Okay, so um, really great talk. Um, I was looking at the, uh, your two heat maps that you had up there showing the cludins um, and the brain. And I saw that you had clutin-5 on the brain was actually increased, but in the tumor it's tissue, it was yeah. gone. Yeah, it's completely and gone. And so my question is, are, have you looked to see when those things are actually increased or decreased during early development, and are we seeing a recapitulation of early development by the loss of clutin-5? Actually, it's, it was not our maps. It, I took it from an article, but uh, uh, let's say <sighs> this loss of tight junctions is, let's say, usually, connect, in my opinion, is connected to the uh, grade of, um, let's say, of uh, progression of the tumor. So in the later stage, I think, and this is what they saw there, uh, I expect that the, the claudines, claudines will, will go down because you just disconnect the cells from each other and then they start spreading. I, actually, I don't know. I, I don't know, but I think it's an interesting question. And the more we know about that, I think the more we have to check, especially for these details. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, then thank yeah. you again. And uh, we, have to, um, we have to continue, unfortunately, with the program. Okay. Uh, but there, um, 